Online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Elon Musk decides to buy Twitter after all, white students are banned from Black History Month events at Westminster University, and mermaids are on the rocks. This is Free Speech Nation. Welcome to Free Speech Nation. Every now and then, viewers of this show get in touch to give feedback. Sometimes they take umbrage at an opinion I've expressed. Sometimes they make suggestions for future guests. Sometimes they just want to praise my exquisite taste in ties. OK, I made that up. But sometimes I've had regular viewers of the show contact me to ask why it is that I so often cover stories relating to transgender activism and women's rights. And I'd like to take this opportunity to explain why. The rise of gender identity ideology is one of the most significant cultural shifts we've experienced in recent years. It isn't just about accepting people for how they want to dress, what they want to call themselves, or how they want to live their lives, none of which anyone has a problem with, but rather that we should reorganise society around the concept of gender rather than sex. And this has major implications for women's rights, because single-sex spaces such as domestic violence, refuge centres, hospitals and prisons depend first and foremost on biology. It also has major implications for gay rights, which were secured through a recognition that will always be a minority of people who are attracted to members of their own sex. When you disregard biology, in other words, you disregard gay rights. Now, I've said all this before, but why does it bear repeating? Well, I'll tell you, it's because GB News is the only news channel that does so. And this isn't meant to sound triumphalist, it's just a fact. And so I feel it's important to return to this issue on a regular basis, because that media silence most definitely needs to be broken. There have been serious consequences to this negligence in the media. If you ask the average person what they think about the prospect of male rapists identifying as women and then being transferred to female prisons, they mostly won't know what you're talking about. They probably won't believe it has ever happened, but it has. And in a few cases, those prisoners have gone on to commit further sexual assaults. And consider the implications for the sporting world. For a long time, a small group of courageous athletes, people such as Martina Navratilova, Mara Yamauchi and Sharon Davis, have been trying to draw attention to the problem of biological males in women's sports. And they were ignored by the media and called bigots by activists. Kathleen Stock wrote a brilliant book about how women's rights depend upon a recognition of biological sex differences. But it was only when activists hounded her out of her job at the University of Sussex that it made the news. Helen Joyce wrote a best-selling book about this issue. And when I interviewed her on this program at the time of its publication, she said to me that no other news channel had invited her on to speak. Why not? Well, the truth is, that most media outlets have been captured by the new quasi-religion of gender identity, and they have been unwilling to platform voices who might question this belief system. It's like the world of news media has suddenly been taken over by fanatical priests, and all of a sudden, we don't hear from the atheists anymore. And this is largely down to the influence of Stonewall, a charity that used to support gay people, rather than demonise them as sexual racists, as its CEO now does, and Stonewall has a policy of no debate. Well, they may as well call it no heresy. And so it's hardly surprising that we should get radio silence from those media outlets that are under its thumb. 
And although GB News is a relatively new channel, a small fish in a big pond, I can at least say that we've done our utmost to draw attention to these issues and offer a platform for those people who are speaking out. And this week, we are seeing that this silence, this journalistic negligence, this failure to enable a public discussion has had some serious repercussions. The trans youth charity Mermaids has finally come under a degree of media scrutiny this week. Better late than never, I suppose. You'll remember that Mermaids is a group that recently took LGB Alliance to court in an, an attempt to have it stripped of its charity status. And why? Because Mermaids takes the view that a charity that defends the interests of gay people is somehow transphobic. This isn't true, of course, but gay people and feminists too have become accustomed to these kinds of slurs. Many years ago, mermaids used to offer sensible advice to the parents of children who were struggling with their gender. It would suggest a more hands-off approach and pointed out in its literature that in most cases, these feelings of gender dysphoria in childhood would be resolved naturally through puberty. But in recent years, it has adopted the gender affirmative approach, which has resulted in children being fast-tracked onto harmful medication. The majority of these children will have other issues that account for the dysphoria, as I pointed out on this show many times. The studies are absolutely clear that there is a strong correlation between gender nonconformity in youth and homosexuality in later life. So Mermaids has been complicit in an ideology that seeks to fix gender non-conforming children according to heterosexual norms. It has claimed that puberty blockers are harmless and reversible even though evidence is clear that this is not the case. A recent investigation by The Telegraph revealed that mermaids had encouraged breast binding for young girls without parental consent. This is a harmful practice that can lead to all sorts of medical problems, including breathing difficulties and broken ribs. Well, the Charity Commission is now investigating mermaids and all hell is breaking loose. This charity has been supported by major corporations. Starbucks and Wagamama have previously run campaigns in association with mermaids. And celebrities have been falling over themselves to declare their approval. But now, tweets are being deleted, evidence erased, because it's becoming increasingly clear that mermaids, for all that it has been perceived as being progressive, inclusive, and on the right side of history, is in fact regressive, reactionary, and a danger to the very people it purports to help. And it doesn't stop there. Over the past few days, it has been revealed that one of Mermaid's trustees is an academic with a long history of writing in support of paedophilic desire. Now, even the most ardent free speech absolutist must surely concede that these kind of writings should disqualify him from being a trustee of a children's charity. It's clear that Mermaid's wasn't undertaking due diligence, but diligence was never the priority here. It was all about the ideology. In the court hearing with LGB Alliance, a representative for Mermaids admitted to having not read the CAS review. Now, this was the report into the Tavistock. This is the gender paediatric clinic run by the NHS, which was found to be unsafe for vulnerable children and was shut down. And the chair of Mermaids said in court that the CAS review was, quote, not Mermaids field. Not Mermaid's Field. The CAS Review is one of the most significant reports on the healthcare of children with gender dysphoria that has ever been produced. If this isn't Mermaid's Field, then perhaps they should stop sending breast binders to kids. Of course, many of those who supported mermaids in the past have been conspicuously silent this week. Others have doubled down and declared that mermaids is being targeted by anti-trans activists. But this isn't true. I've spoken to numerous critics of mermaids and gender identity ideology more broadly, and not one of them is anti-trans. But of course, there's a lot at stake here. People eventually are going to have to admit that they supported the sterilization of children, many of whom were simply autistic or were likely to grow up gay. Many decent people have been hoodwinked into supporting this dangerous ideology, and so of course they're going to find this difficult to come to terms with. But sooner or later, they're going to have to face up to reality. Too many people know about it now, and the truth is getting out there. This is what J.K. Rowling wrote in August 2020. An ethical and medical scandal is brewing. I believe the time is coming when those organizations and individuals who have uncritically embraced fashionable dogma and demonized those urging caution will have to answer for the harm they've enabled. Just like the myth of Cassandra, these words were powerfully expressed, but largely unheeded. Rowling, in fact, was monstered and smeared as a bigot for pointing this out. And now, two years later, people are starting to see that she was exactly right. After the events of this week, it feels like the tide is turning, but this really isn't a time for complacency. Activists aren't going to give this one up without a fight.
They're too inv invested in their fantasies. They have convinced themselves that they have been doing good, even though the evidence now shows that they have been doing harm. They have convinced themselves that they are fighting armies of transphobic hate groups, even though these are mostly just spectres of their imagination. Their actual critics are just women, gay people and their supporters who are concerned about the erosion of their rights and the safeguarding of children. So yes, at the risk of repetition, I'm going to keep talking about this subject because too many in the media are still silent on this issue. And believe me, this is far from over. And my studio guests this evening are the wonderful Scott Capura and Francis Foster. Now, these two are, are among my favourite of the panellists that I have on the show. Francis, you are doing a tour soon, so I think we should get straight into plugging that. When, when does your tour begin? It begins on Tuesday in Southend so, um, and Bristol. So if you, if you want to go to Southend on a Tuesday night... Who maybe, doesn't? Who, who doesn't? doesn't? You know, maybe life hasn't worked out quite the way you wanted it to. <laughs> and, you know, you think to yourself, I just want to see how it can get worse. Come to Southend on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you say that we were gigging together in Swindon on Friday. We were. You left early. Uh, I Good did. I did. To do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a busy man, you know, and busy, busy. Swindon is charming. It was adorable. And the people were great, actually. The, the audience is fantastic. They yeah. really liked you. They were great with Tanya. They were, you know, they were fine with me. Did they enjoy your set? They, they were okay. You split rooms, don't you? you divide I, my favorite furniture is a room divider. And uh, <laughs> a woman got offended, so I'm like, you win. Yeah, right. yeah. Good for you. You didn't have any walkouts, though, right? No, they couldn't walk. It's wind in their tools. Yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, only emotionally crippled. But it was great. <laughs> the show was really fun, and I, it was an honor to be there, actually. Beautiful. Well, place. now that we've alienated everyone in Swindon, <laughs> let's get some questions from our lovely audience. Our first question now is from Christina. Where, where's Christina? Christina, yeah. How are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Um, should 16-year-olds be allowed to change their gender? Should 16-year-olds be allowed to change their gender? So this is coming off the back of what I was talking about earlier on, but this is specifically... The Scottish government. Now, you might have seen there were these viral clips uh, over the last few days of a group of uh, feminists protesting outside of Holyrood, outside the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and this was organised by a group called Four Women Scotland. Great group of people. We've had them on the show before. Uh, this hasn't got, been getting much coverage, but the Scottish government has introduced plans to lower the age when a person can get a gender recognition certificate mm -hmm. from 18 to 16. Now, they say it won't change or remove women's rights, but there is a conflict here. For instance, this week there was a story in The Times that revealed that half of the 16 transgender inmates in Scottish prisons began transitioning after they were convicted. So, and six of those prisoners have current or previous convictions for sex offender, offences. So you wonder, don't you, uh, Francis, you know, look, uh, of course people suffer from gender dysphoria, of mm -hmm. course there are people who need to present as the opposite sex, but when sec people who are guilty of sexual assault in prison suddenly decide they want to be moved to a women's prison, red flags do start to emerge, don't are they? Are you trying to ruin my career, mate? Yeah. <laughs> is that what you're doing? You don't want to talk about this, but, no, that, but, no, but no one look, does. This no, is the issue. Look, the problem is, is when it comes to an issue like this, is that everybody wants to be compassionate, everybody wants to say and do the right thing, but also, there's a little something called common sense. Yeah. And we all understand at its most basic fundamental level that women's spaces exist for a reason and that women's spaces should be protected. And when anybody ever asks me and goes, well, why? Well, think of an example of a nightclub. If a woman, or when a woman, I should say, gets unwanted male attention in a nightclub, where's the one place that they head? the female toilets, because they know that they're going to be safe in that and the bloke can't come in. Yeah. Now, if you abolish these places and you abolish these safe spaces for women, what you are doing is you're putting women in danger. And we need to be honest about this and realise that these places are actually important and they're important for women. So I think a lot of the stuff that's going through the uh, Scottish Government is based on compassion. I think yeah. it genuinely is. It is. I think people are thinking, well, you know, if, if, you're, if you have gender dysphoria, if you need to present to the other sex, either through surg surgery or through how you dress or whatever, then we need to support those people. But I think the feminist point is extremely valid, is that if you're a predator, if you are someone who does exploit people, you can exploit that loophole, right, of self-ID. Yeah, I, I, I suppose you can, and I suppose that's on their minds, and I suppose because they're predators, they have a strategy, and it's working perfectly for them. I mean, when I was 16, I would have loved to have been put in men's prison, but... That's a very uh, different situation. And, um, yeah. You're a very special case. I was. I, I was very special. I mean, the thing about this is, is no one is saying, which is what a, a lot of the detractors say, no one is saying that trans people are predators or more prone to being predators. They're not saying that. They're saying people, if you can just identify yourself into another biological sex class, then obviously yeah. that's a loophole that some 
people will exploit. I mean, that's all that people are saying. Of course. And I think, you know, I think women, uh, most women I know would agree, like what you said, Francis, yeah. that they prefer to have a space that's yeah. theirs. I mean, if not the women's toilets, then than the gay, gay guy's Uber. That, I've driven a lot of women home. Um, and, and I understood why they were terrified, because they're in a situation that seems untenable. They don't know where else to go, what to do. We need to make it uh, any social situation as safe for, for women as and, possible. And look, the reality is that the overwhelming majority of, of uh, uh, sexual assaults are committed by men. They, you know, they just are, and that's the reality of it. Mm. Now, it's interesting, because um, these clips were really fascinating. I was watching some of them online, and these were the protests by feminists outside of the parliament really wasn't picked up by, by the media very much. This is um, Helen Joyce, now we've got a clip, I think. Helen Joyce wrote the book, Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality, uh, and she spoke at the rally, and here's just a short clip of what she had to say. There was never a woman in a women's prison in Ireland for a sex crime before 2015. And now there are three, and they're all men. You were doing it here without the law. But you can row back. There's still time. I don't know how, but you have to. I'm so emotional when I think about the prisons. When I decided to write my book, I thought, I really innocently thought that if you said to somebody, but what about if you do this, you'll be putting rapists in women's jails, I thought they would say, oh, I didn't think of that. What can we say? They did it. They're doing it. Shame. 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 So, and it's an interesting one because this debate isn't being had, but the evidence is in. There have been cases of, of, of male uh, criminals guilty of sexual assault being transferred to women's prisons and committing sexual assault there. Mm. It's actually happened. So this isn't theoretical anymore, is it? Mm. I mean, There's so, seven cases, actually, right. in the UK. And, that, and, that, and it, so it shows that it can happen. You know, if you believe, if you believe in the notion of gender self-ID and you can say that anyone can declare it and they are therefore the thing they declare themselves to be, what about those seven people? You are you know saying what, that no, that's I, right? I, I've mentioned that to people, friends of mine, mm. and they've said only seven. Wow. I said, isn't one enough? Right. How about zero? Mm. These women are already in desperate situations in prison. Oh, let's make it worse for them. Unbelievable. And it's... the women in prison are some of the most vulnerable women in the that's country. You know, mm. uh, it, is, it is kind of amazing. And I think just a debate, I know you, you, you joke, but it's true, like, having the debate puts you at risk to a degree. Like, pe of course you know, it does. people call you a bigot, they call you transphobic. These women are being smeared as hateful and monstrous, mm. and if you talk to them, you're like, this is not the case. They're just concerned about their rights. A lot of women right. don't want to hear men talking about their rights. There's yeah. that, too. They yeah, don't want to hear sure. us going on and on about their rights. When, like but what if said, they need someone to sort it out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and you said men tend to be the most sexual predators because we're number one. And I think that makes them feel even more insecure. Yeah, of course. Of course, but this, is what, but this is one of the reasons why I continually invite feminists onto this show to talk about their issues, because they, you know, so many of the channels are just not inviting them. I've anyway. lost so many friends over J.K. Rowling. So really, many really. people won't talk to me. They tell me to keep my mouth shut, that she should shut up. I'm like, why should she shut up? Wow. Because that's really, you don't agree with That's her? really empowering, isn't it? Telling, telling a woman to shut it's up. Insane. So, But that's interesting as well, because J.K. Rowling has never actually said anything no, remotely transphobic, no. right? And when I get in these arguments online, I always say, can you just quote? Quote the thing she said. That's transfer. Just one. That's all. Just one will do. They never, ever, ever, ever can. And you'd think they'd say at that point, oh, maybe, maybe she hasn't said anything. I That's, think yeah. part of the problem is that we made, and, and, you, and both of you will understand this far better than me, is that we made such a hash of gay rights. Yeah. And gay people had to struggle for so long to be treated as equal, to, to be treated as equal right the way through society that people are now looking at this particular issue and they're worried that they're going to make the same mistake yeah, sure. that we made with gay rights and that, the, and that people are going to go through a hellish time just to be accepted. And I think what has happened is that in, we're trying to be compassionate, we're trying to be kind, which is, of course, a good thing, but in doing that, we're throwing the metaphorical baby out with the bathwater where we're not actually acknowledging why women's spaces are so important in society. But also, this is not the same as the homophobia of the 1980s and 1970s in any way. No. Because actually what this is, is a movement, an ideology, that rehashes those old homophobic mm. tropes. Why else would the CEO of Stonewall be saying that women who don't want to sleep with men, with people with a penis, are sexual racists? Like, that's not... That's what homophobes used to say. You just haven't found the right guy yet. <laughs> so the idea of this comparison is so erroneous between now and 1980s. But in a way, in the 70s, the gay sex was better, so I'm hoping... <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they, we brought monkeypox back again. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, you were younger there. You were more virile. I was, yeah. 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 More yeah. athletic. Bendy. More bendy. bendy. You were, weren't you? Very flexible. I saw the photos. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to move on now. Question from Mary. Mary, where's Mary? Hi. Hello, Mary. Do you want uh, Elon Musk to buy Twitter? Do I want Elon Musk to buy Twitter? I should say so. Uh, but this is interesting because he said ages ago he was going to buy it, and then there was big, this big hoo-ha about the fact that he'd asked them to reveal how many of the social media users are bots, and they refused to reveal it, and then that became a legal case, and it looked like he wasn't going to buy it. But now uh, he says he is actually going to buy it. You must be thrilled. Look, what this, this, is what, this is what Elon Musk needs to do in order to make the world a better place uh, on Twitter, right? He buys it, then he turns that effing thing off. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole world will improve like that. True. I hate Twitter, and I'm on it a lot. I know. <laughs> like, it, but it's, what those, it's like when you're addicted to a, a, a nefarious substance. Yeah. It's, you hate it, but you still use it all the time. It's really bad. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's your monster. It really yeah, is. Yeah, you I can't know. stop. I can't. I worry about you. <laughs> I, I mean, we're on it because we're performers, and we're trying to keep a social media pro profile. Yeah. But it, were I not, I, I much prefer my anonymity. It always surprises me about Elon Musk. He's the richest person in the world that he doesn't want a bit of anonymity himself. He can afford it. Why does he want everyone to know I where he, he loves it. doing all he must Why, though? It's yeah. crazy. But there is something that he could do here. I mean, the truth is that Twitter is run by uh, people who are very much ideologically in lockstep, mm. right? So that's why feminist accounts, to go back to that point, they always get booted off. Uh, anyone who says that there's a difference between men and women gets booted off. Uh, people who call for the wholesale eradication of Israel, they can stay, mm -hmm. apparently. That happens. That was the, the um, Supreme well, Leader... Members of the Labour Party. <laughs> 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 it was the, the Supreme Leader of Iran had actually tweeted out that he wanted the wholesale destruction of Israel. Yeah. And they kept that up. I think the tweet is still up, yeah. but they got rid of Donald Trump uh uh, the, at the same time, you're like, mm, okay. Well, how about they, Elon Musk's ridiculous opinion about what uh, you know the, the Ukraine should do in the position they're in right now? They just give up their property to Russia, so everybody calms down. That's yeah. what he said. That's a diplomatic solution. Just give back the property that they say they want. This they, is something that Elon Musk. Yes, is. that's what he has said last week. But look, he's a free speech advocate, and he's suggesting that if he buys Twitter, you're not going to get kicked off for unfashionable opinions. You know, that's quite good, isn't it? It's so weird. I watch him. I think just because someone's rich doesn't mean they're a hot or b smart. It's so weird. He might just have been <laughs> lucky. Right? <laughs> he is smart, though, I think. I guess, although those political viewpoints are just going to get people in trouble and kill. Yes, but you wouldn't support people being censored for their viewpoints, would you? No, but I, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> but I just think he's found a platform that can make himself even more famous, even more powerful. He might choose to be a bit cautious where people's lives are concerned. Well, let's just move on. We've got, we've got time for one more question in this section, and we will get back to other people's questions later in the show. Uh, this is a question from Ryan. Hi. Hi. Uh, should a nurse be sacked for saying Tory voters don't deserve to be resuscitated? <laughs> OK, so this was Miranda Hughes. Now, you must have seen this clip because it, it went viral online. Mm -hmm. And this was on a TV show, I think it was on Channel 5, mm -hmm. and she made the statement saying that she... She said it was a joke, right? And she okay. said, uh, at speaking as a nurse, that if you voted Tory, you didn't deserve to be resuscitated. She backtracked pretty quickly, she, right? Uh, yeah. She doubled down on it when she first said it. Uh, did she? She said, I'm sorry, that sounds mean. I'm sorry it does. It's just the way I feel. So here's the question. Now, we talk about cancel culture all the time. When people express unpopular opinions and then activists go after their employer and sort of say, you know, you should fire this person because of their opinion. I don't agree with that at all. Not at all. And I also think, you know, it's possible to misspeak, attempt a joke and get it wrong and all the rest of it. However, there's also professional conduct. Like, if you're a nurse, you will know that it's in your contract that you can't talk on TV about letting patients die. Mm. I think that's a, a fairly... That, like, <laughs> th th there is a kind of fine line, isn't there, between, like, cancellation for an unpopular opinion yeah. and scuppering yourself by obviously saying things that violate your contract. There are all sorts of things I could say right now on air that would get me fired. <laughs> I'm thinking of a few right now, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it because I know that I've signed a contract that said, you know, if I didn't want this job, I shouldn't have signed the contract, yeah. right? If I want to say those things, I shouldn't have agreed to do the job, right? So it's not quite cancel culture, is it? No, it's not quite cancel culture. Uh, the fact that she said it and then she doubled down on it mm. makes me... It makes me almost respect her. Do you know <laughs> what really? I mean? You know when she said that? and. Really, if she has that opinion, she should just go and work in the media because that's what they all think. Yeah, that's a very good point. You, you She'd know, do well. She's, she's she'd obviously very well. media savvy. She's been on Question Time as well. She, she does the rounds. Yeah, listen, go and work in the comedy industry. Say that in a comedy club in Islington, you'll get a round of applause. It's true. <laughs> Everyone will love you. You don't even have to write jokes. You just no, say an opinion like that and they love you for yeah, it. They'll, they'll name the club after you. They're real. Yeah, they will, yeah. I mean, I, how does she know they're Tory when she's trying to resuscitate them, though? That's my question. That's a very good point. I, I, Rich and white. Right. I think they've turned <laughs> <laughs> I can't breathe. I think I really I do wonder though what what 
Well, I think they put her in the front row. I think Jeremy went toward her, Jeremy Vine, because he, they knew that she was a bit... Do you think? Mm, but, do you, but do you take my point that it might have been an attempted joke that just didn't... Mm -hmm. You know what no, I mean. No, you know more about that than I do. I do, I, think I do. <laughs> Yours always lands. They always <laughs> land well, and uh, they always get me in trouble. I think that she... I think you're right. I think she's, she, she was moving forward quickly in a thought. Yes. And she said too much. But I think... Jeremy kept pushing it if you watch it. Okay. Oh, you can't mean that, can you? You didn't really mean that. Oh, please. And she's, no, I, re I really did mean it, right? Oh, I see, I Listen see. Listen to me. And I think she was surprised at how much power and control she had, actually, how much trouble well, she it, had. It makes people vulnerable on TV, because like, people don't, they don't behave in the it's way they so normally funny. would. It's so funny. You know, we're all making our own film. We're all on Facebook, Twitter. We're all the star of our own movie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we forget that there are other extras in the film that may not agree with us yeah. and that may, you know, decide to fire us from our job. Yeah. But here's one. the thing I don't understand. Like, so this woman said, look, if you're a Tory, you know, you shouldn't be resuscitated. And I'm like, well, if you hate Tories so much, why are you working at a private hospital? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, she's not the NHS. Yeah, exactly. No. You don't even work at the NHS. <laughs> yeah. You work at a private hospital. You need shed loads of cash to be there. Chances are the people in there aren't going to vote Labour. Yep, yep. Total hypocrite. Anyway, <laughs> after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be speaking to two Iranian women's rights activists about the continuing protests in the country. See you in two minutes. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Protests in Iran have entered their fourth week following the death of Masa Amini after she was arrested by the country's morality police. Rights groups say that more than 185 people have been killed. Hundreds more have been injured and thousands have been arrested by security forces. Yesterday, female students in the Iranian capital, Tehran, chanted get lost <laughs> as the country's president, Abraham Raisi, visited their university campus. So to get more on this, I'm joined now by Iranian women's rights activist Munita. Uh, we're hoping to be joined by Elna Sabah as well. Munita, you explained to me, to my colleague earlier, that Munita is, not, is your activist name. Could you tell us maybe why you're using a, a, a false name here? Absolutely. Uh, hello to all of you, first of all. Um, I chose to go by Munita because um, my family, immediate family, resides in Iran, and um, uh, this government has a track record of harassing our families in Iran. So uh, by this, I'm just trying to make their job a little bit harder to track down yes. my family and harass them, pretty much. 
So we're talking about a tyrannical regime here, aren't we? And, and finally, we're seeing people taking this stand. But can you give us some sense of the kind of oppression that women are under in Iran? So it's very fascinating because I was listening to your show. It's fascinating what people are fighting for in, uh, in Europe and what we were fighting for in the Middle East. So this government, sorry, I know your show is a, is a, a, a comedy, but I have to get serious a little bit about no, it. No, it's not all comedy, don't percent. worry. We can talk seriously. Um, so what happens in Iran is that uh, women, after the 1979 revolution, prior to that, women were allowed to uh, go outside hijabless. We had uh, female politicians. We had ju female judges. But after the 1979 Islamic revolution, a year after, immediately a year after, uh, they passed a law uh, um, mandating women to wear hijab to go outside of their houses. And from the age of seven, I and many, all of the women in Iran were forced to wear scarves, hijab, in order to be able to go to school and get, get educated. And uh, they, we, our schools were also gender segregated. So schools for boys and schools for girls. So I'm talking about the entire nation. It's not just one school or two school. Everybody had to wear hijab in order to be able to get educated. And then years went on, they started uh, enforcing this hijab morality police. So if we would go to parks, if we would go to um, uh, trips or anywhere, just like Masa Amini, who was in Tehran for a visit uh, to her family, and she got arrested and she was brutally beaten by the hijab police and later she died in custody. So these are the real, um, uh, problems that we have and issues that we have in Iran. And this government, from the beginning of taking the power, they made a strong statement that they are the dictatorship. So for the world not to realize this and yet um, uh, work with uh, this regime, for us Ir Iranians, it's not understandable because everything, they have all the characteristics of a dictatorship. Uh, women don't have freedom in Iran. Uh, students get murdered. Right now we have students as young as 16 who, who were murdered in Iran uh, protesting for their rights of speech and their right to uh, freedom to choose what they want to wear. We can't even ch wear what we want. We want. We can't uh, wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and, uh, you know, fix ourselves to go outside the way that we want. We have to uh, obey the Islamic dress code in order to be seen in the society. Yes, we have actually got our other guest, Elnaz Sabah, who's going to join us as well at this point, I believe. Uh, Elnaz, we've just been hearing from Munita about uh, the situation in Iran and what women have to face. Um, but do you feel that, um, could you give us a little bit about your background and your involvement with this cause? Sure. Um, I, I was born in Iran. I grew up there. I lived there until I was 28 years old. So I experienced firsthand what it means to live under the Islamic Republic. And I moved to the US um, afterwards when I was 28 years old. And um, here, at some point, um, I realized, even though I'm living in the U.S., I am still afraid of the Soviet Republic. And I want to share the story. In 2018, there was this Iranian girl on Instagram. Um, she danced beautifully, and all she did was putting a video of herself dancing on Instagram. And the Islamic Republic arrested her and closed her account. And, and she, um, she was forced to a confession. And um, at that point... Uh, you know, I love dancing and I want to share this. I mean, there's a lot of background here. A lot of people might not know dancing in public is illegal for women in Iran and singing as well, uh, beside everything else that um, that other, your other guest was telling us. Um, so they asked this girl and I'm thinking to myself, um, I love to record a video of myself dancing and publish in her support. That's my first thought. And then my second thought is like, oh, if I go back to Iran, I'm going to be in trouble because I'm supporting this person, even though I'm doing this outside Iran, where the law zone apply. And I realized 7,000 kilometers away, I'm still afraid of Islamic Republic. And, and then it hit me that, oh my God, you know, I have to um, start being afraid of this and I have to you know, talk loud, and that might mean I'm not be able to go back to Iran because if I go back to Iran, I, uh, you know, 
I might feel consequences. But at this time, I decided that I need to be echo of the voices of Iranian women. So I joined. Um, so you bo you've so both you, you've both had experiences where you both grew up in, in Iran under this regime, being forced to wear uh, the Islamic dress uh, in accordance with the morality police. But I've heard women in the West, feminists in the West, sometimes say that it's empowering to wear the veil, and this is something that that, that is is almost like a feminist symbol. Um, what? Do you, how do you respond to that? Well. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Elas. I, I would say to me that's a symbol of oppression, honestly, because you have to wear it. It doesn't matter if you want to wear it or not. I was seven and I had to wear it to the school and I did not want to wear it. As a seven-year-old, I didn't want to wear it and I had no choice in that. And that means my opinion as a woman, I got the message that my opinion didn't matter. I have no voice. I, you know, I couldn't. So psychologically, it, it taught me how not to say no to anything. And that goes from like saying no to hijab, saying no to other uh, oppressions that were going in Iran, saying no to asking for kind of accountability. Even I would say it affected my, my mar marital life because, you know, I felt I didn't matter. So Munita, do you, do you think it's just that people in the West aren't familiar with what's going on? That's absolutely what it is, um, because feminists, if feminists are, are always saying that, uh, they're advocating that my body, my choice, how about Iranian women? How is this our body, but Islamic Republic's choice? So if they, or even the LGBTQ rights, currently in Iran, September of 2022, we had two female LGBTQ activists who were, who are on death row right now. They've been sentenced to death because they were activists for LGBTQ uh, uh, community. On what uh, crime? Corruption on earth. That's the title of the crime that they've been sentenced to death for. So where, where, are, the, where are the community? Where is the LGBT community right now to stand up for the LGBT community in Iran right now who are on death row? Where are all the feminists in the world standing up for us to say, Iranian woman's body, Iranian woman's choice. Where are they right now? Are they raising a voice for us? Do you think, Munita, it's because um, there's a kind of cultural relativism where people in the West feel that if they are to pass judgment on Iranian culture, that this is Islamophobic or this is bigoted or prejudiced in some way? This is what they created in the West. Islamophobia is what's been created by the West and uh, it's been fed to the media. Standing up for freedom should never be labeled as Islamophobia. And I'm going to explain why. Because uh, when the feminists that are talking about Islamophobia and they've always shut us down when we try to raise our voice are not listening to the Iranians. Prior to 1979, hijab was not mandatory in Iran. So how is this our culture? when up until 1979, this was not mandatory, and then all of a sudden from 1979 in the past four decades, it became our culture? No, it's not our culture. This is not our culture, and the world needs to know that. Standing up for freedom is not against uh, 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 fr Islamophobia, because like, if, if a woman wants to wear their hijab, go ahead, wear it. We, we support you, but we don't want to wear it, so you need to support us too. If you're standing up for freedom, so Elnaz, if would not, you agree? Then that's bigotry. Elnaz, would you agree with this that that we need more support? Iran and the Iranian protests and the Iranian women need more support globally. Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you know, we saw how people rise up and came to rally when uh, George Floyd was killed. We have a worse situation than that in Iran, and we really need solidarity from all people, and even more than that, because now the regime of the Islamic Republic is something that Iranians don't want, and we want the world to realize that and don't deal with them. I mean, in terms of ideology, they don't have no difference between. There's no difference between them and ISIS, except that, you know, they, they dress better, they speak English fluently, and they smile when, smile when they shake their hand. But at the same time, what the way they treat women is as bad. Um, you know, it's as, um, as, a, as a woman, you have no right to the custody of children. You can't go as a mother to a bank and open a bank account for your children. And this is what Iranian people realize. This is Iranian women want to change, and they are speaking loud and clear. There is protests in more than 100 cities, and people are like, 
that's the dictator and they really don't want this regime and we want the rest of the world to recognize that that we don't want it's this it's interesting to see in some of the videos where I've seen images of protesters burning their veils and dancing in the street, which, as you pointed out, is not, is not legal. A lot of them are very young. A lot of them will have grown up under this regime. They're not the ones who, who lived before the revolution and saw what it was like to have that freedom. So this is clearly something that, that, that women are united by within Iran. Is that right? Is that a fair thing to say, Munita? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely a fair, fair thing to say. This, uh, the, and this movement started with uh, a beautiful chant, which says, women, life, liberty. So this is, uh, this is a movement that Iranian women have started. So it cannot get any more feminist than this for the feminists to back us up. And then it got backed up by Iranian men, Iranian students, everybody throughout the country. They stood up behind the women and they said, you know what, enough of this. We don't want this oppression on our women. We don't, we don't want this. So, and the world needs to realize that it's not just forced hijab. Iranian women aren't allowed to sing, ride bikes, simple things like that, ride bikes. We are not allowed to swim in open water. We're not allowed to enter st uh, sports stadiums. Uh, we're not allowed to get freely divorced from our husbands. We're not allowed to leave the country unless authorized by a guardian or our husband. We're not allowed to go to school unless authorized by a guardian or a husband. And if they decide that we shouldn't, we cannot go to school. So this is, an, an, this is a systematic um, uh, 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 discrimination on, uh, on a particular gender. I'm not saying that Iranian men are free to do anything they want, no, but uh, it's systematic when it comes to, to the women in Iran. So uh, that's why it's very important for all the feminists and activists around the world to back us up, because it's all about freedom. The message is freedom. And once Iran within the Middle East, if you ever follow Middle East news uh, before, prior to 1979, Middle East was very peaceful. People would travel there. There was no bombs and attacks and this and that. But right after 1979, the minute the Islamic regime took over, everything started to go wrong. And uh, they're again, they're, this regime is just anti-Semitic. They are homophobes. They are misogynistic. They're everything that the world today is saying that, no, we don't want to welcome that anywhere in the world. But yet again, they sit down with the heads of the states and they try to negotiate with them. Elnaz, can you know I bring you in right? here just to ask about these current protests? Do you feel more, because there have been uh, attempts at these kind of protests before that have been sort of quashed by the regime. But this feels different. This feels like it's gaining momentum with more and more support from various factions. Do you have a, an optimistic sense that this could actually lead to maybe even regime change? I do. I do. Because this is day 25. This is day 25 that's ongoing. And it's ongoing despite the brutal um, suppression that you can see on the street. The, the, the regime is hitting back people, they are using pallet guns, they are shouting at people's faces. And, you know, today there was a video of a school girl, school, the, fe the female uh, uh, high schooler, who came out and said, sending a picture of her said, and said, I, I'm hit by a pallet gun, but I'm going to go to the street. I'm not going to give up until we have this regime gone. So we have seen this before in 2019 uh, government did the same thing they shut down the internet they brought the security force they shot people and then they squashed the oppression but this time this time we see that people keep going into the street every day despite the, the brutal oppression and there is a confidence there's a sense of confidence among the women that we haven't seen before and i think for me what i see is this a tipping point we have crossed the cross a boundary that Iranian women will not go back. They will not adhere to Islamic laws that the Islamic Republic is pushing on women anymore. And, um, you know, I, I'm very, very optimistic. Well, we're almost out of time, but quick final word to Manita. Your thoughts on that subject? Uh, what's happening right now in Iran is um, Iranians are not after reform. It, it's very clear what they want in their chance. They say death to the dictator. They want this regime out the door in the back shed. And they're very clear with delivering their message. And the world just needs to start listening and call this a revolution for what it is.
Well, I, I, the courage of these protesters I find quite remarkable, and I really appreciate you both coming on. I hope you can come back on the show again to talk about things as things develop. Thank really you. appreciate it. We would it. love to. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much for indeed. Having us. So after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be joined here in the studio by Baroness Claire Fox as we look ahead to next weekend's Battle of Ideas Festival. Don't go away. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. to Free Speech Nation. Later in the show, I'm going to be turning agony uncle with the help of my beautiful panel, Francis Foster and Scott Capuro, and we're going to help you deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. Uh, so if you've got any problems, send them in. And this week, there is an incentive to get in touch. So the best three dilemmas chosen by my crack team of producers will win one of three pairs of tickets to next weekend's Battle of Ideas Festival in Westminster. Uh, so please email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. We'll do our best to answer your issues. And if you write a particularly entertaining one, then you'll be going to the Battle of Ideas next week. And they're not cheap tickets, so you should get in touch. Uh, now. Next week's edition of Free Speech Nation will actually come from the Battle of Ideas Festival in Westminster. And this event has been running since 2005. It has two days of uh, debates and discussions with over 400 visiting speakers. And it has the motto, Free Speech Allowed. Uh, Baroness Claire Fox is the director of the Academy of Ideas and she convenes the Battle of Ideas Festival. She joins me now. Yay. So, Claire. I love the Battle of Ideas, as you know, I, I come every year. I think it's a, it's a highlight of my year, frankly. Um, just this opportunity to have all these different people with different opinions thrashing it out in a way that's becoming quite unpopular, really. Yeah, who'd have ever thought that free speech allowed would be a revolutionary slogan? I mean, <laughs> you know, that's what's ended up being. But I think that we're in a situation now where talking about politics is something you have to do while you're watching the telly, unless, of course, you're in the audience of this show. And everybody just feels so frustrated. We're watching people make a mess of things. And our attitude is that we have a takeover of Westminster in which the public are the people who do the talking. So no disrespect to the 400 speakers, of which you are one of them, but actually they're only there to prompt public conversations. And the issue that we're trying to do is recreate the public square. Yes. You know, a sense in which you can have arguments, discussions, you raise your ideas, you don't flounce off and say, I find that offensive when somebody says something you disagree with. You argue against them. Yes, That's I love that about the festival. I've seen yeah. some of the most robust discussions because as a, in each session, you're constantly going out to the 
crowd to get their views. And I've seen people disagree with each other, but it's always, like you say, people don't have tantrums. They, they disagree profoundly, but they have those things out in the open, which is so much better. Yeah, and also there's lots of different themes. So, you know, there's strands of debates on science and medicine, on the economy, of course, on all the culture wars issues, education. The reason I'm saying that is because it's not siphoned off into, are you interested in this? The idea is, is you go to all these different events. I mean, it really is a bit like, somebody once described it as the Glastonbury of ideas. I mean, <laughs> that's a bit overstating it, because Glastonbury's <laughs> become so dull, whereas the Battle of Ideas isn't. But anyway, you get your, uh, you get your armband, and you literally you can go, oh, I'll have to choose between one of 10, 12 debates, and you go along. And of course, with everything like this, it's not just the debates, it's the sense of uh, camaraderie, mm. not because you're in an echo chamber, but a sense of solidarity that everybody there is open-minded. Yeah. Open-minded disagreeing, but serious and committed without being po-faced to actually solving the, pro the problems that we face. And I mean, I'm in the House of Lords, I'm in Westminster every day, and I can safely tell you that I wouldn't trust what happens in the parliamentary estate to solve our problems. <laughs> the people who will solve the problems that we face, and God knows they're serious, war in Europe, major economic problems, and not all just caused by the Tories, deep-rooted problems. Who's going to solve it? We are, the public. It's every single one of us have got to rise to the challenge. And that's, in a way, what the Battle of Ideas does. It's meant to kick-start a year's worth of saying, right, what are we going to do now? How are we going to solve these problems? And really dig deep beneath the headlines, beneath the spin and all the mottos. And, you know, you say, go for growth. What does that mean, right? How are we going to actually grow the economy? That needs to have a proper discussion. Yeah. And I trust uh, the public more than I trust the politicians, even though I'm one of them, and even <laughs> more reason why not to trust <laughs> us, um, to solve those problems. So just to give people an idea of how it works, it's a weekend. There are How many sessions are there per day that you can choose from? How, how I think work? at any one time there's 10 or 11 sessions going on. There's about five sessions per day, five or six. So you, get your, you can either buy a day's ticket or you can buy a weekend's ticket. Hmm. And although it's a brilliant prize, to win, and it's expensive and worth a lot of money. It's also cheap if you're buying a ticket, so I don't want people at home to not buy them. And, uh, and we've got loads of special deals. But anyway, you come along and you literally look at the programme and think, I'm going to go to that, 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 and you change your mind halfway through, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I should point out that it is incredible value for money, because it's, what, 100 quid for a weekend pass. And, and that's without all the reductions for students, yeah. and school students. pupils, free for one day, um, students, something like half price. I think it's £27 for a Some, student. Yeah. yeah, so there's lots of great deals on offer. But it's not... I mean, God, nobody's got enough money. But yeah. If you're ever going to invest your money in anything, it has to be in our own capacity to change the world for the better. Absolutely. And this is a place to start. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, I would really urge people to come to this because it, it's, it's such an enthralling debate uh, event. It's, it's fantastic. Um, are there any particular sessions this year that you're looking forward to participating in? Well, I, I, I'm really looking forward to... Um, the opening keynote that I'm sharing, which is, do the culture wars really matter? And it's really interesting watching your show so far tonight, because, you know, people might say, well, I'm worried about my energy bills. Why would I be interested in all this trans stuff and all this, uh, you know, mermaids and your opening speech? But actually, your opening segment indicates to me that you cannot let these things just simmer under the surface and be ignored. So I'm looking forward to, because there's going to be a row at that, I can tell you, I'm because sure. there will be people who <laughs> won't agree. Um, I, a lot of the education debates, like, are, the, you know, are our kids being indoctrinated? The issue around uh, uh, social contagion and, uh, contagion and trans. The issues around Ukraine, yeah. very important. Historically, what on earth has happened in relation to Russia? How have we got into this? Can we get out of it? So the geopolitical issues, I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, and as I said, I'm doing this show there next weekend as well. We're recording actually on the Saturday, so if people want to come, but they should come for the whole weekend. But I've got James Dreyfus and Rosie Kay who are talking about their experience of council culture. Yeah, and yeah. There, and talking to Matt Ridley, and it'll be a, a really fantastic event. You know, I, I, I'm glad that you say so, but I really want everyone to come along because it's it's the atmosphere. I mean. Yeah. A weekend of politics at the moment might sound like, oh, my God, I can't imagine anything worse. A weekend of us taking control of politics at the Battle of Ideas, at Church yeah. House in Westminster, whole different ball game. It'll inspire you, I hope. Have you, have you found that things have changed since you first set up the Battle of Ideas? Because, of course, you're going back to 2005, and I think there was a more sort of tolerance for the idea of open debate back then. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm saying when we said free speech allowed, it was kind of, that really wasn't 
you know, the main theme. Yeah. As time has gone on, we have found that more and more people are reluctant to debate. And we do work extremely hard to get lots of sides represented. Lots of environmentalists will be there. I'm not entirely enthusiastic about a lot of green orthodoxies. But to their credit, they're going to come along and have the debate out with people who think that net zero is a waste of time. But a lot of people won't come. I mean, cancel culture has made cowards of a lot of people, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, I understand you don't want to lose your job and so on, but what that means is that there's a lot of people who say, um, I'd rather not be on a platform with that person or that person or that person. Luckily, there's enough people who are prepared to argue and, uh, and, and, and aren't running away from those arguments. But you're right, things have changed. We've but become more illiberal and more intolerant as a society. It scares the hell out of me, which is why Free Speech Nation and having GB News involved in the battle of ideas is so important to me, because this programme, I don't know about anyone else at home, but I mean, I'd go mad without it. And I'm not just saying that to you, because actually you need to be able to know that issues that are being swept under the carpet festering under the carpet can be raised. So yeah. they can be raised here yeah. and at the Battle of Ideas. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I was looking through some of the speakers you've got and I have to say, some of the people you've secured, um, I've invited onto this show and they won't come on. So I think you you are, are a less toxic uh, pro proposition, maybe. I don't know why that might be. I, I don't know. The idea that, I mean, I am very toxic to a lot of people, <laughs> but I think that there's still quite a lot of people who uh, appreciate that a festival that actually does try to cover all angles it does, yeah. and attract an audience, by the way. It's not an echo chamber. I can't stress to you. I'm not interested in only talking to people who agree with me. And it's very important that we all have arguments out there. We don't dismiss uh, our fellow citizens as being stupid or sheeple or, you know, ignorant or whatever. I mean, they're just like you and me. If they've got a different opinion, I want to win them over. And so I think we've got to keep that spirit of debate and not hide away or demonise people we don't agree with. And because we don't do that, I think that actually there's a very mixed set of opinions at the Battle of Ideas. The one thing that unites everyone, though, is, is that they recognise that they should take ideas seriously and debates and discussions and politics seriously. Because I don't want to be the victim of politics. I don't want to sit and watch it happening. I want to take control of the destiny of this country and what's happening. I mean, this is serious times, folks. War at the heart of Europe, the worst economic situation that we face for decades. History, we're told, is all horrible and we're not to look at it anymore. It's been wiped out by some aspects of the culture wars. We've got to learn from history and we've got to take control of the present in order to shape the future. Fantastic. Claire, can you just tell us and remind people, how can they find more information? How can they get tickets to the Battle of Ideas? I've got to put my glasses on, everybody. That's <laughs> very good. I'm getting old. Right, so it's um, Battle... Well, I'm going to leave leaflets for the live audience here. Um, and it's uh, Battle of Ideas org.uk. Go on there, you can see all of the details. And in case there's anyone who can't get to London next weekend, we've got a Battle of Ideas Day in Buxton on November the 5th as well, and you can come to both. So, yeah, get in touch. Hope you win the competition yes. uh, uh, to anyone who's watching uh, that, that, that uh, Andrew's organised, but I also hope that people will buy their tickets. Tell your friends, get as many people there as possible, and I'll leave leaflets for you lot. So scatter around your friends and neighbours. <laughs> Claire Fox, thank you very much. So just a reminder there, if you're at home and you want to send in an unfiltered dilemma, this can be any personal problem you have, if it's related to free speech, all the better. Send that in and you could win two uh, weekend passes for you and a friend that's worth £100 each, so it's a £200 prize. We've got three sets of those to give away, so email those in right now and I'll announce if there's any winners at the end of the show. Uh, and after the break, I'm going to be bringing you an interview with Bev Jackson from LGB Alliance after they had a stall at this week's Conservative Party conference. Don't go away. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, if the Tories continue their infighting and undermining new Prime Minister Liz Truss, they'll be out of power for a generation. As the SNP start their annual conference, is an independent Scotland now inevitable? We'll speak to a top figure from the SNP and showbiz legends, the Crankies. Plus tomorrow's papers with full panel reaction, politics legend Anne Widdicombe and our quiz of the week. A busy Sunday night show. See you at nine. Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. The LGB Alliance had a stall at this week's Conservative Party conference. It's the second year in a row that the campaign group has been at the conference, though they were nearly excluded from last year's event after a protest by the party's official LGBT group, the LGBT Plus Conservatives. LGB Alliance were not permitted to attend the Labour, the Lib Dems and SNP conferences this year or last year. Now, I spoke to Bev Jackson from LGB Alliance in Birmingham at the Tory party conference earlier this week. Last year there was a bit of hostility towards your presence at the conference. Do you think that things have improved? Oh, I think they've improved massively. And what we've really um, noticed this year, I mean, we had a very positive reception last year once we, we were in. And uh, we've had not only a positive reception this year, but people know more. Last year we had a lot of people saying, what are you about? And this year people know that, so you, you definitely get the impression that there is a new, uh, a new kind of atmosphere. There's more knowledge among the general public as to the issues that we're facing. But people will say, you know, when you're at the Tory party conference, not at the Labour party conference, does this suggest it's a partisan movement, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, not at all. Of course, we, we try to get into all, all party conferences. Labour just refuses us uh, out of hand. Um, at, at the Lib Dems, we were accepted until a few noisy voices said, oh, no, we can't have that. And then we were... Um, there had been a so-called administrative error, and uh, we tried to... Um, ex contact them and get some sensible reply and we haven't had had one so obviously we're not we're not a political uh, organization at all we we operate across the political spectrum and we hope to be at all party conferences can you explain to people watching why it is important that lesbian, gay and bisexual people can organise uh, separate to transgender people, which is of course a different cause? Well, it's really important to organise for uh, um, people who have same-sex sexual orientation, just like I did in 1970 when I was one of the founding members of the Gay Liberation Front at LSE. And, I, you know, I said then, uh, it's important to know we're not ashamed to be homosexual. It's terrible, I have to say the same thing again. But as you know, we're just about to have our second annual conference at the QE2 Centre in the heart of Westminster. And uh, we hope that you'll come, we hope that everybody will come. And people who have heard uh, uh, odd things about us do come and find out what we're really about. Because we're really about um, uh, protecting the rights and, and interests of people with same-sex sexual orientation. I mean, so much of the language is getting changed and people are talking about how homosexuality is same-gender attraction and actually this sort of gets to the heart of 
what it means to be gay is it's about biological sex. It's about that recognition, isn't it? Well, it, it, it absolutely is. And, we, you know, homophobia is still rampant throughout the world. And, one, you know, we, we do feel that the pendulum has swung this year and our conference is much larger uh, uh, and, and m uh, more international than last year. I'll be doing a panel, for instance, on fighting homophobia around the world with a man from Uganda, a woman from India, uh, uh, and uh, a Green MP from Austria, uh, and a man from the United States, who all of whom will have very different views on how we have to fight homophobia. Let's not forget that homophobia still exists also in the UK, and it, it, it isn't the same as, as, as identity issues. We need to separate them because people with same-sex sexual orientation and who don't uh, aren't interested in, in, in gender issues need to have their rights protected as they are in the Equality Act. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, old-fashioned style homophobic tropes coming from gender identity ideologues. They now seem to think that there's a war on between these people, but it's perfectly possible for people to coexist and not have this conflict, isn't it? Of course, it, and, and uh, one of the, the, the nice things that happened at the beginning of this conference was that some people came over from LGBT conservatives to talk to us and say that this year they were very happy for us to have a stand here, so the relations are improving and we hope that, that we can get together and, and, and have co a, a conversation in which we discover what we have in common. We have an awful lot in common. There are some things, on, uh, areas on which we disagree, especially the medicalization of children, uh, teenagers, who, who think that they might be uh, 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 the opposite sex and who later, ten years later sometimes, realize that they were just gay or, in many cases, lesbian. Yes. Um, tell us about the conference then. So you've got the LGBT conference. It's on uh, 21st of October. Yes, the 21st of October at the QE2 Centre in the heart of Westminster. So if you go to, to our website, you can easily find tickets there. And as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a huge conference this year and it's taking place in a very different atmosphere, an atmosphere in which people, the public has now become alert to the different points of view that they are, that the, the public is, is engaged. And, and we have, we've sold more tickets already now than, than we had last year and uh, as I say we have an international panel we also have a large youth contingent um, and there'll be a, a really important young people's uh, um, event on the things that, that young people or children and young people are watching um, online which I think will, will really quite surprise a lot of people uh, so a lot is going on we'll have some some breakout sessions and and much more participation than than last year and a disco so you know it's going to be a great day and a lot of your detractors the people who say all sorts of things about you online who've fallen for the myths that have been spread about you. Shouldn't they come along as well and, and discuss? Of course, the, uh, you know, they, they should come and, and engage with other people. One of the worst things about this whole sex and gender uh, um, uh, issue is, is suppression of debate. And when people only exist in their own bubbles and don't engage with other people, we can't advance. You do need to talk to people who disagree with you. I was just talking to some young people who, who really um, didn't agree with me, but they were willing to listen and talk to me, and I'd, I'd much rather have discussions like that all day than simply talk to other people who agree with me. Yeah, well, there's hope for the future, yeah, I think. I think um, there is a lot. As I said, the pendulum has swung. Dave Jackson, thanks very much. Thank you. And it's just gone at five past eight. This is Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. OK, so let's get some more questions from our lovely audience. Our first question is from Donna. Donna. Hi, good evening. Do white lives matter? Oof, contentious <laughs> question. Do li white lives matter? <laughs> it's actually, it actually makes sense in, in the news cycle, right? So basically, Kanye West has worn a shirt with the slogan, White Lives Matter, at a fashion show earlier this week. Uh, Kanye West was criticised by the Anti-Defamation League Civil Rights Group. They said White Lives Matter is a white supremacist slogan that is a racist response to the Black Lives Matter movement. This is complicated, though, given that Kanye West is black. Mm. What, what, what do you make of that? I mean, this is... It's almost like he's winding people up to isn't get Isn't it? Reaction. Isn't it? Yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, and to get a little bit of notoriety, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Kanye, God bless him, what, what is he on? Uh, <laughs> you, you just, whenever he comes out and he says something, you're like, this is just calculated to wind people up. He, whether, he's, he, whether he's trying to wind up people on one particular side or another, look, we all know white lives matter, we all know black lives matter. You just see this and you go, how much of this is authentic and just how much of it is actually a little is, bit of a do, stunt? Do you think it's really the case that he's planning on running for... President, I mean, this is well. I mean, this is something You're that he's asking said, me to understand well, well, what's going through Kanye West's mind. He wore, mind, he wore a cap which said 2024 on it. 
Yeah. That's not just a random date, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But there are other issues on this, Scott, because I, I believe last night, now I haven't read all of this, but I believe last night that he was posting some quite anti-Semitic tweets, right? So uh, is it just the case that he's losing his mind? Does he have this kind of these kind of prejudicial... He, well, he's done that before. He's also a, 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 a very um, vocal Trump supporter. I think that's what the hat meant. He wants Trump to run he, uh, in 2024. I, I don't he think he really... I, uh, maybe, but I don't think so. I think he's really... He's pushing Trump, actually, on Twitter and online to run. Like, Trump needs to be pushed. But I think <laughs> what's going on, too, is, yes, the notoriety. I also think that he... he I think that he gets bored. I really do. I think he's, he <laughs> might have a short attention span. And he might be a bit eager to get people to love him. And I, I really think that he thinks it's funny. I think that he... Really? Thinks, yeah. <laughs> I think he thinks that it's what his mom would have wanted him to do is what he said. But it's not funny, though, is it? When, when he's saying explicitly anti-Semitic things, that's... And not that. And particularly for someone who's so famous, mm. has such a wide reach. I mean, that's massively irresponsible. But I think the T-shirt might have been ironic because he's African-American, so he's trying to be funny. He's trying to push people in a funny, comedic mm. way. I think he thinks they took it wrong. Like this nurse that we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, maybe. What, any other thoughts, Francis? He actually made a very interesting point, which is, if you always... And this was an interview he did where mm. he said, if you're always trying to say the right thing in the right way, then really you're not living life. What you're doing is you're going through life like it's an exam. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say things that are interesting. Now, the White Lives Matter thing, I think, I agree with you, I think it's a stunt. Mm. I think it's a play. I think it's a way to get him himself talked about. It's a way to poke at people. Then you get the other stuff with the anti-Semitic stuff and you of awful vile and whatever else. But I think this is some, somebody who loves being in the public eye, loves being talked about, and does these little stunts in order to get himself... Well, but are we three comedians that missed a joke? Is he being ironic? Is that what it is? Well, is he saying, I mean, they keep saying it, so here you go. Is it important? Does it maybe, mean anything? Maybe. You know? Well, we've got another question now from Bill. Bill? Where is Bill? Oh, I'm here. Oh, hello, Bill. Good. What's your question? Um, the question should... Julian Assange be uh, extradited to the United States. Yeah, well, so we saw Russell Brand and Jeremy Corbyn and hundreds of other people. They were taking part in this demonstration in central London yesterday. Uh, and they were actually, I think they, they formed like a chain uh, with sort of some yellow tape mm. or something. And, um, and Julian Assange's wife, uh, Stella Assange, says the case is a stain on the United Kingdom and a stain on the Biden administration. Assange, as you will know, founded WikiLeaks, and he's wanted to stand trial in the United States after he was accused of breaking the espionage act. So it's an interesting one, though, Scott, because to what extent do we say, look, I understand the argument that the, these were state secrets that put people's lives at risk or whatever, yes. but the, he is a journalist, or at least was fulfilling the function of a journalist. Right. He leaked information that was passed to him in a journalistic capacity. Right. Does this set a dangerous precedent for journalistic freedom? Fry him. Goodness me. <laughs> put, put him in the chair, fry him. He's a spy, he got caught. He's hiding in different countries, countries that don't really have decent relations with the U.S., or they do, and he's putting politicians in very awkward positions all over the world. Scott... Fry him. Now, Scott does... Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. <laughs> Scott is uh, often... He put, he put the U.S. at risk. He put U.S. security yeah, look, at risk. And it, the security of the rest of the world, too. Scott's very sensitive about this because it's obviously his home country, but also he has a tendency to hyperbole. <laughs> and that reporter uh, from The Guardian who did the same, too. Yeah, but the he's, now living, is, he's now living in Brazil. Think about... In hiding. Listen, I understand your reservations about Assange and everything else. I'm talking about the precedent. Mm. If you start saying that, you know, journalists can be uh, locked up for leaking information that was passed to them. That creates all sorts of problems, doesn't it? Well, I never thought that I would agree with either Russell Brand or Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> yeah. true, but uh, in this case, I think they've kind of got it right. I yeah. think it's a journalist's duty to shine light on issues or topics such as this one and bring it to the, to the public attention. There is no evidence that anyone's life was put in danger by mm. the leaks. There, you know, that doesn't exist. So, so Not yet. Well, well, that's what he's hoping for. But his life was put in danger. But fry him. But you must understand. <laughs> you are coming across as a bit authoritarian. No, here, look, Scott. I think you know, I, I think that it's it's really easy to you know if you're on the left especially to say, oh, but these are things we all need to know about. If you read a lot of what he exposed, some of it's useless and meaningless. But some people have been put in prison over this already. I don't know why. I don't see why he's escaping. He's the one. He's the origin. He's the nexus of all of it. So for you, Francis, is, is, is your issue about the precedent that it sets or is it specifically about what Assange did? I think it's did? a precedent that it sets. Yeah. I think, look, we live in a society now where more and more journalistic freedoms are under threat and the right to protest is under threat and the Tory government have brought that in. 
I think it's really important that people who speak out shine a light on certain issues. We we stand up for them. But well, that's I not what this is about. This is about leaking state secrets that he knew was illegal to leak. No, but the secrets that were being leaked were examples of criminality within the state. Mm. So when the state commits acts of criminality, it is definitely in the public interest, is it not, Again, for, that, for us to know that? He's a spy, technically, and he's been caught. So put him to trial. Let him, let I, him defend I himself. I don't think... I'm sensing we're not going to agree on this at no. all. And that's fine. That's part, <laughs> of the, that's part of the joy of the show. Mm. Next question now is from Annika. Where is Annika? Hi, Annika. Mm. Hi. Does um, Liz Truss have a fascist taste in clothes? <laughs> uh, well, this is very interesting. So um, you may have seen this article in The Guardian that put a picture of uh, Liz Truss in her outfit. There it is. Uh, and you can see that Emma Thompson is wearing a strikingly similar outfit in the other picture. But that is a fictional female dictator character that she played on TV uh, a few years ago. Um, it's this character, Vivian Rook in the science fiction miniseries Years and Years. And so, you know, what's that headline there? Why did Liz Truss wear the dress of a fascist? I mean, look, <laughs> this is why people don't take The Guardian seriously, right? <laughs> Let's be absolutely honest about it. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, she bought the dress before the show was on. It's a nice dress. She looks fab. <laughs> it's, it's a standard dress that Karen Millen, is that the designer Karen Millen? Is that correct? It's a Karen Millen You're dress. You're so gay. Call, I know. Call, <laughs> well, I have a 31 inch waist and look fantastic on me, so. But it, it's called the, the Forever Dress. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's been a. It's been a staple in that. Right, and designers. you know, Liz Truss rocks it, fascist rock it, everyone looks good in that dress. You know? Look, but here's the thing, if, she was, if they were going to call a dress fascist, it should have at least been designed by Hugo Boss. Absolutely, <laughs> that's absolutely right. Those shiny, shiny boots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't understand why this is even a story. And I know that the writer of the programme, Russell T Davis, tweeted it out, but he was, I think, obviously making a joke. Yes, yeah, it was just a joke. But the, the way the Guardian reported is like, there's some sort of sinister backstory to this, that they, like Liz Truss has got this co of, of advisors who say, yeah, I think we should dress her as that fascist character <laughs> to signify as a dog whistle to our followers that secretly we're... I, I mean, wish she was a fascist, because they at least had a strategy and a plan. <laughs> She's got nothing. <laughs> and if she was a fascist, just come out dressed like Eva Braun. Yeah, why not? <laughs> just do okay, that. OK, moving on rapidly. <laughs> Our next question is from Shelley. Where's Shelley? Hi, Shelley. Hi. Should white people be banned from Black History Month events? Now, this is a fascinating story. So we saw this at the University of Westminster. They banned white students from Black History Month events, and they said they'd taken the decision to encourage a safe space for discussions and honest conversations. However, social anthropology lecturer Dr Neil Thin, who's been on my podcast, he said it was tragic. We've had Toby Young of the Free Speech Union also criticise the decision. I would criticise that as well. I think, I think this, this uh, idea of racial segregation as a positive, progressive thing, yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of dead against that. I don't think that's right. What I mean, well, it worked out so well last time we tried segregating people. <laughs> Didn't it? Didn't it? I mean, it worked out brilliantly, South Africa. It worked... This is irony, by the way. Can I just say that? I think Please, they get... Don't clip this I and think... make it go viral. I think they get that, Francis. <laughs> yeah, I, but I... people on Twitter won't get no, it, No, that's Andrew. true. That is true. That's they true. Will, certainly will but, not you know, get it. It's, look, again, like, some of this stuff can be really well-intentioned, right? But it just it shows how regressive some of this stuff is. It, like... I, I would push back against that, in the idea that it's well-intentioned. If you think this is a good idea, you are a moron. Hmm. You're, you're an idiot. That's what you are. Yeah. But I would push back on that and say morons can be decent people, right? right? Some of my best friends are morons. Right, I know. You spend a lot of time with yeah. comedians, <laughs> Exactly. What do you think, Scott? Do you think there's any merit in the idea of racially segregated spaces? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> what a question. I don't. I don't. No, but and it, it, it was reminding me, we were talking earlier about women's rights, that you brought up South Africa, that yeah. those rights that they're trying to push right now, uh, you know, people that don't like women, obviously, uh, seem like the rights that South Africans were denied hmm. for so long. It does seem like segregation again revisited. But it, but it's not just about race. We've had um, universities are introducing gay-only dormitories and stuff like that because people say they need a safe space away. Isn't from that the YMCA? They, they, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> or, or, the, or the drama... That's what the song said. Come on! <laughs> or the drama degree majors. That was my yeah, 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 yeah. It would be. You know, I, I mean, I think, you know, maybe these uh, young students want to feel safe in the world. Yeah, yeah, maybe they can give everything. They can do a multi, you know, one and the... I don't Yeah, but know. isn't it quite sad that we've, we've, we've reached this point where people feel that to be in a, a group of people with different skin colours, that's somehow unsafe? I mean, that's really sad. Like, it, it's it like is, the opposite yeah. of what Martin Luther King was How else about. are white people going to learn to dance? <laughs> well, there is that. You, you can dance pretty well already. I've seen you throw some shapes. It's I pretty impressive. It. My husband's Brazilian. He's taught me. 
A few things. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to go into that. <laughs> it's a family show. Next question is from John. Where is John? Good evening. Over here. Hello, John. Yeah. Good evening. Is the former footballer Gary Neville a hypocrite? <laughs> so, Gary Neville, commentator Gary Neville, has been criticised because he emerged he will work for Qatar's state run broadcaster, mm. be in sports at the World Cup. And Neville spoke at the Labour Party conference last week. Uh, he wrote on Twitter, Yes, I'm going to the World Cup, and yes, working for ITV and be in. I will highlight these issues like I have for years. Is he really going to do that? I mean, if he does do that, he deserves a round of applause. Really. Because yeah. I'm right thinking Qatar hasn't got the best record on human rights. No. I believe no. that s some slaves but were... put it, They like punching down. Naturally. Let's put it that way, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's very interesting because we have all these sort of protests in the UK where yeah. Black Lives Matter, football is taking the knee and that kind of thing. In Qatar, where slavery actually goes on, that would be the place to do it, right? Mm -hmm. That would be incredible. They would actually say something about... But the, the problem with this is people, generally, by and large, who are completely illiterate and they don't know but what, what the issues that they're talking about. I remember Pe Pep Guardiola, the Manchester City manager, who is owned by Qataris, mm. right, coming out and talking about why the BMM movement is important because of the history of slavery. <coughs> And the transatlantic okay. Apparently it's Abu Dhabi, not Qatar. Yeah, oh, so Abu Dhabi, yeah, yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm now racist, right? Okay? <laughs> but you just go, yeah. like, do, do you actually understand what you're discussing? So that, yeah, they said, what do you think about that? Because, like, you know, gay rights not great in Qatar either. Actually, I've been there, I've worked there. They're quite gay friendly, to be honest with you. Are they? Well, they are. not officially. Not no, in terms of the... no, God, you can't use the word gay, they'll kill you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you can practice what you preach if they, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you can get off your knees. No, it's great. It's, it's great oh, there. No, it's great. It's great. You're going to get me fired. No, I, uh, we're gonna... well, no, you know what I mean. I know um, what you mean. You were talking about prayer. You're very exactly. devout. Very yeah, devout. Yeah, you went yeah. to Catholic um, school. Explains a lot. No, but... Next... <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, 5,000 people, yeah. 5, people have died building that stadium. I well, this is that. it. This is it. There, there, you know, there is so... Was it really a good idea to do the event in Qatar they have anyway? To? I, I mean, I don't know. why not avoid... Like money influence their decision. It's weird. Yeah, isn't that right. weird? Anyway, very depressing. Next question we've got is from Anthony. Where's Anthony? Yeah. Hiya, hi. Good evening, Andrew. Are you worried by the threat and harassment aimed at female academics? Yeah, I mean, this has been an ongoing uh, thing, but this, uh, it, this is a story that broke this week. Oxford University's outgoing vice-chancellor says she's especially concerned by threats made towards female academics, particularly on social media. Uh, this is Professor Dame Louise Richardson, and she revealed that she's been, uh, quote, shaken by the level of threat and harassment experienced in recent years by some of their academics. I mean, you'll recall a few years ago, Selena Todd, who's an academic at Oxford, mm. she had to have bodyguards accompany her to some lectures. I mean, that passed relatively quickly, but it shouldn't happen at all, right? And these were people, because she'd taken a gender-critical stance, or just mm. that she believes that there's a difference between men and women, activists were, you know, threatening her. We've had, we've had Rosie Duffield, who was unable to mm. go to the Labour Party conference last year because of threats from activists. I mean, this is something that keeps happening. Kathleen Stock, of course, is a, a major example of this. St some of the activists were dressed in blas black masks, setting off flares, very intimidating yeah. stuff. I mean, wh what's, why is it that the authorities at the universities aren't clamping down on this? Uh, because they're scared. They're scared to be labelled transphobic. They're scared to be labelled bigoted. Um, and they are all massively guilty. Most of them have some version of white middle class guilt. So they feel that by standing up for these academics, that that therefore makes them transphobic. On my show Trigonometry, we actually interviewed Kathleen Stock, and when she was recounting what had actually happened to her at the University of Sussex, it was awful. And you could tell that she was actually very traumatised and quite understandably so which, by what happened. Which is why it makes me so angry when people say, oh, they're just holding her to account for her terrible views. Well, one, her views aren't terrible. Oh. Have they read her book, Material Girls, which is an excellent piece of work and is in no way hateful? If you just took the time to read the thing you're criticising... If you're going to hold someone to account for their views, probably don't wear a balaclava while she's sure, doing it. Sure, right, yeah, that would help. Exactly. You know. what, do you, what do you think is going on, Scott? Because aren't universities meant to be the place where you can have different disagreements? The, that's the place where freedom of speech flows. I'm amazed that people have stopped learning how to talk. Everything goes from zero to 100 so yeah, quickly yeah. now, especially between the young people who are doing all this all the time and they need constant, constant reassurance, constant, constant, constant activity. I, I feel like, you know, it would be nice too if on campuses, because I work on campus as a comedian, to see some more diversity amongst the student body. And I don't mean skin color or gender. I mean in terms of income. That would change this conversation very quickly. It's interesting that the, the posher the university, the more likely it is to have these troubles. That's a huge surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine <laughs> rich young kids being entitled. I, I have no idea what that looks like. I, <laughs> they're very pampered and they don't have to worry about 
defending yeah. themselves in the future, what the real world might be like. But if you put kids in there who are, who are there to, to find a way to make an effective living where they can make a difference, that would change the entire What's it like effect. gigging on? I haven't actually done a gig on You students. know, in universities, they tell you, you've got to be, you've got to be careful with, the kids are fine. Yeah. They just want you to speak about such a pattern they're familiar with. That's okay. But that's okay. our job as comedians. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. That's the same everywhere, basically. I think it? it's fun. Yeah. And who doesn't want to hang out with a bunch of 19-year-old drunk kids? <laughs> Moving on <laughs> to a question from John. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? John. Hello, John. Hi. Should Will Smith be eligible to win an Oscar? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you, of course. So, <laughs> some Academy Award voters are refusing to back Will Smith ahead of next year's Oscar ceremony. And, of course, uh, you know, he's just done this new film, Emancipation. He's been widely praised for it. However, he is banned from the Academy Awards for 10 years for slapping <laughs> Chris Rock. I mean, you must have seen that event where, where, where Chris Rock made a joke about Will Smith's wife. Will Smith actually laughed. You can watch the clip back. He laughed. Then she looks over at him and he's like, oh, walks up and slaps Chris Rock. Chris Rock, by the way, was a hero the way he took that yeah. because he, he, did, he didn't... He fall over anything. He didn't fall over, he didn't I flint. would have cried, totally would have cried. <laughs> and like, being in, hear it. Yeah, and being in front of the, you know everyone's watching. And they're good friends, by the way. Right. Will Smith and Chris Rock. I mean, that must have been but incredible. But the wife got in the ear and that's it. Mm. That's it, that's it. All, you know, it's so strange. I, who knew that the most dangerous place on earth in March wouldn't be the Ukraine, it would be Los Angeles when Will Smith was an Academy Award, <laughs> at least for comedians, because now we're targets. Anyone can take a swing at us. So this is an interesting question, Francis. Is it the case, and a lot of people have said this, that since he slapped Chris Rock, it's kind of set a precedent where people feel like, oh, well, maybe we can just attack comedians if they offend us. You know, I mean, you've been attacked. There's someone threw a bottle at you once, didn't um, they? Oh, yes. Some people threw glass at me, a, gla a glass. Yeah. It came through the dark. I, mean, I, turned, I turned her table over and kicked her out. But it does. It starts to become yeah. fisticuffs if you're not careful. It does. You know? I mean, you deserve it a little bit. But I mean, the thing is with you, Francis, you're a nice person. So you don't really... Are you worried? Are, are you worried that this will happen? Well, that, just, that sounds like damning with fame. Right? <laughs> just means you're deeply uninteresting. Um, but no, I think the problem is, is when we start using the terms words equal violence or words are violence, yeah. then all of a sudden, if someone makes a joke that you dislike, then you have been on the receiving end of violence. And therefore, that therefore means that then you can go up and be violent to the comedian. So this is a worry because Louis C.K. was attacked by that guy on stage. Mm -hmm. um, who else has been attacked? I mean, we've had um, uh, Chappelle, Chappelle, Dave Chappelle. Ben uh, Norris, a local comedian in, in uh, London, it was punched at really? a club in London. Yeah. Jerry Sadowitz was uh, punched in Canada. Um, I, I had a, a, a pint of beer thrown in my face, you might exactly. remember, at the Edinburgh Fringe yeah. by someone who was upset by me. You and were quite snarky, though. You were quite <laughs> snarky. I was a bit snarky, but I was in, in role, in character. You know, that was my character. character. Yeah, a stand-up character. Okay. Persona. <laughs> it means I can get away with saying anything. Yeah. But it was interesting because that video clip of the guy throwing beer in my face, that then went viral and sold out the run. It always right? does. Yeah. And it looked like I'd deliberately done it. And I had people turning up saying, oh, I might throw some beer at you. I'm like, that's not what I do. It's like, this isn't my shtick now. No, it's it's just what your agent wanted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the clips you see on Facebook now, or Twitter, or whatever, comedians, it's, it's them doing audience stuff. It's not their material. Right. It's them being heckled. People really like it. And Do it's they? part of the culture here. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, anyway, after the break on Free Speech Nation, we are going to be discussing the Crown Prosecution Service's public consultation on proposed new guidance regarding gender ideology. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria DiPiero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints over a drink. 
we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. The Crown Prosecution Service has launched a public consultation on proposed new guidance regarding the treatment of deception as to sex in rape and serious sexual assault cases. Critics say the proposed guidance illustrates the impact of the government allowing gender identity ideology to embed itself across our public institutions. To discuss this, I'm joined by the former criminal barrister, Dennis Kavanagh. Welcome to the show, Dennis. Um, this is uh, quite a, a complex subject, so perhaps you could talk us through what exactly is the Crown Prosecution Service proposing here? Well, I suppose the sensible place to start is the background to this, which was in 2015-ish. Stonewall and co were campaigning to, in, in effect, water down um, sex by deception prosecutions as they signed up to the extreme trans lobby, and it's um, led to the consultation we have before us. And I can tell you that it, uh, it's the first rape policy I've ever read that finds reasons not to prosecute uh, defendants. Um, it is a curious document that says this. It says, if you've got a situation where someone is deceived as to the biological sex of someone they're having sex with, the first question it asks Crown prosecutors to ask is not, uh, were they deceived? Was it a bad deception? Instead, it says, no, we must take an offender-centric view and ask whether they were living as their new gender identity. But that's quite a shocking uh, development, isn't it? Because it's excuse-making for a form of sexual assault. It gets worse. Um, not only do we have the first question, which is p staff in the Crown Prosecution Service sort of marking people out of ten yeah. for their gender identity, when you get to question two, which is, yes, there has been a deception, prosecutors must ask themselves, has the victim, quote, uh, willfully closed their eyes to the obvious? Now, that is gender identity's version of was she wearing a short skirt. Yes. That is it's, an extraordinary... It's victim-blaming. It's, it's absolutely so, victim-blaming. So I suppose their counter-argument in this would be, well, you know, if someone uh, identifies as the opposite sex and therefore believes themselves to be the opposite sex, which gender ideologues do, yeah. and then they uh, participate in a sexual act but they don't inform the other person, because from yeah. their perspective, they are that authentically that sex, even yeah. though it involves this denial of reality. Yeah. Then, then they would say that that's therefore not sexual assault. There hasn't been deception, they would say. Well, what have we got there in criminal law? The belief of the defendant, yep. which is not based in material reality, trumps the deception of the victim. That is gender identity, ideology, corruption of a public institution. Because what is important, and this is crazy when you consider this service has got to look at evidence in serious criminal matters, what, tr what is paramount, it would seem, is the belief of the defendant. And I've got to ask myself this, and I'm sure many people will. Who on earth is speaking up for the victim here? Because the balance of criminal justice depends, does it not, on one side the defence speaking up for the accused, uh, and one side the Crown speaking up for the victim. I don't see anything here speaking up uh, for the victim. It's entirely focused on the defendant's gender uh, identity, uh, whatever uh, that may be. And this consultation tells us that, that gender identity could be things like gender queer, non-binary, gender fluid. There's all this language now. And I say in passing, it's bad news for any employee of the Crown Prosecution Service who's gender critical, because they cannot operate this draft policy. Because question one um, says, look at the gender identity and tell us if that gender identity is convincing or not vis-a-vis um, the deception. This is institutional capture. And we've seen this again and again and again with gender ideologues. We have the phrases assigned male at birth, assigned female at birth, classic gender identity, um, uh, lingo franca, all over this consultation. 
And this is in a week, of course, where we've seen the effects of institutional corruption. Uh, we've seen what's happened in the safeguarding scandal, uh, allegedly, uh, at Mermaids. It's off the back of the Tavistock being closed down because it is not safe, in the words of Hillary Kess. That's what happens when this extremist ideology corrupts public institutions. And here it is in the Crown Prosecution Service itself. But why is it the case that it is there? I mean, why is it the case that a, a let's face it, a belief system which is not rooted in reality is now trumping uh, reality? I mean, we have this situation now where ideologues and activists, they want to reorganise society around the idea that gender supersedes sex. So it's not just the case that they want to take into account people's gender identity within these frameworks, but actually that it should replace the notion of biological sex when it comes to formation of policy. Well, there's no public mandate for this. There's no constituency that supports this. No one put this to the public in a general election. And again and again and again, we see a certain class of people, principally located in the charity sector and their colleagues, again and again and again, corrupting the language of public institutions. Um, and this, this has happened in the criminal justice context at the beginning of the criminal justice system, at the initiation of the prosecution. I, I, these arguments would not fly in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, which in the Crown against McNally, a 2013 case, which deals with this matter, uh, made very clear that mm. sex by deception uh, can be, can vitiate, in the words of the criminal law, that's cancel out um, consent. Um, here, here we are again. This is classic, um, you just may or may not know about the Denton strategy, which no doubt you've heard of, which is a strategy popularised by gender ideologues who say, look, don't discuss this in public, um, don't put it to vote, tack it on to more popular causes, as, as in Ireland, gay marriage, um, yeah. gender self-ID was tacked on to that, always operate in the shadows. Here we are again, and in a, the most serious area of criminal justice policy I can think of. But if it is established in law that sex by deception, it, it, you are taking away the consent of that person, if that's already established, how can this then be turned over just on the basis of this, this, this faith? Well, quite, I suppose. If you can't win up in the Court of Appeal as a gender ideologue, what you do is you win back in the CPS so that the prosecution's never bought in the first place. But who's, who's, who's allowing that to happen? What I'm saying is, who is the CPS accountable to? Why is it that someone in the government, for instance, isn't making clear that the Equality Act is very clear about sex, for instance, although it is continually misinterpreted as gender identity when it, that's not what it means? Why, no. why are local authorities able to twist these things? Why is the CPS, why are the police, why is the judiciary able to twist this stuff? Don't, don't we ask this question again and again? Again and again, don't we ask this question about why the police are getting the pr protected characteristics wrong, or why the NHS won't say the word woman? You know, here we are again yeah. with the CPS, another corrupted public institution, speaking the language of extreme gender ideology. Um, uh, obviously, CPS, to answer your question, is accountable to the se uh, various secretaries of state, both justice and, and the yes. Home Secretary. And you would ha you would hope that they'd have a, have a look at this and a conversation about what's going on because. I, want, you know, I do want to go back to the beginning here. These cases of sex by deception very often feature teenagers. They feature sexually inexperienced, um, very young people who are very vulnerable, who are often not very worldly wise, who are often manipulated. That's who we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about failing them as a constituency. Yes. And, you know, how, how, what are we going to sacrifice on the altar of the gender gods next? Because we're not going to take rape um, prosecution policy seriously. We're going to end up in a situation where we've got special treatment for one class of defendants and we've got second class victims. Is, it, is it just the case that those people that you mentioned in government don't understand the issues and all they think that this is, is standing up for uh, an oppressed minority in the way that people used to stand up for gay people back in the 70s and 80s against all odds? Is that what's going on here? That, that may well be the case. I've no doubt as well that the government are juggling so many different things that it's always difficult to keep um, on top of this stuff. But I, I would just say this on the gay comparison. This has the capacity to hit gay people pretty hard. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, say, of gay male um, sexual spaces, like, I don't know, saunas, dark rooms, that sort of thing. Yeah. This is an accident and, and a tragedy waiting to happen, this sort of stuff. Yes. Um, because these sorts of deceptions do matter and they, and they will cause serious harm. So then how do we push back against it? If it is the case that this has now infected all of our major institutions, you mentioned the NHS as well. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you've, you've got the Annex B policy that the NHS has where, yeah. where the, the NHS is meant to accommodate people by sex, 
you know, uh, wards for women, wards for men. But the, the NHS official policy is actually if someone uh, identifies out of that biological sex class into another, then you accommodate them that way. And then if someone on the ward complains, if a woman says, I don't want to be on the ward with a, a man, someone with male genitalia, they have to say to that person, that's not a man, you're, you're, you're not right about that. Yeah. That's official policy in the NHS, yeah. gaslighting as official <coughs> policy. Yeah. So what do we do at that point? That hasn't come from a top-down thing. That hasn't come from the government. Right. So how can the government weed it out if they didn't initiate it? Well, I think it's incumbent on all of us to call it out, fight it, and to be active citizens. So the consultation I'm talking about is a public consultation. It's mm. going to close, I think, in mid-December. It's available on the Crown Prosecution website, service website. People should respond to that. We do have to make our voices heard. Uh, on this, and we do need to bring this to the attention of politicians. Yeah, I mean, because we're talking about potentially rape victims here. It's a very, very serious question. Absolutely. Um, and what can people do to sort of uh, to, to push back against it themselves? Is it just a question of contacting politicians, informing them, or is it more about informing ourselves? Because I think a lot of people fall for this trick where activists say, if you raise these issues, yeah. if you say that I can't identify the way I want to identify, then you are a transphobe, you are hateful, you are a bigot, even fascist. You know, all of these slurs that are thrown about, about people who have genuine, legitimate concerns. We, we have to stop being scared to raise genuine legitimate concerns, particularly in such serious fields. I mean, we're at a stage, and I'm sure you've heard this on Twitter, where people are saying, if you say you are same-sex attracted, um, that is hateful and transphobic. The four walls... So to be gay is to be yeah, transphobic? I've heard that. You know, I've heard same-sex attraction is a transphobic dog whistle. Now, look, if you're going to let the four walls of public debate and fear of being called hateful box you in to the point that you can't say anything, then what's the point, frankly? Um, we, we have to address this. We have to stand up to this. We can't have public institutions spewing out policies that are damaging, that are based in unscientific language, um, and that ultimately there's no constituency for, and ultimately have the effect of subverting the rule of law. Dennis Kavanagh, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. After the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be discussing the new film, The Woman King, which one writer claims portrays African slave traders as a band of plucky freedom fighters. You don't want to miss that. See you in a minute. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Free Speech Nation. 
A new film has been criticised for the way it portrays African women involved in the slave trade. An article on Spiked this week claims the woman king ignores African history altogether and caters to the white progressive demand for one-dimensional black caric caricatures of victimhood. One of the characters in the film says that the white man has brought immorality here, which the spiked article argues captures the infantilizing and racist idea at the heart of the woman king. So to discuss this, I'm joined now by the sociologist Frank Ferredi. Frank, thanks for joining me tonight. A lot of people won't have seen this film. Could you perhaps give us some background to what the film is attempting to portray? I think what the film tries to do is to suggest that uh when slavery kicks in in Africa, in Western Africa, you have on the one side the angels, who is the local African population, including the slave traders who've been around for many, many decades. And the devil are these white people, Portuguese and British people, who are coming into West Africa. It's a kind of fantasy film where white is, white is bad and black is good. And what's interesting about the film is that it totally ignores the, the reality, which was that slaving and slave trading was already deeply entrenched in the culture of the Homi, Benin, large parts of Western Africa. And that in many ways, the horrible slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, could not have taken place without the collaboration of the local slave traders who made a, who, for whom that was their way of life. You watch so the you film. That the, you, you mentioned in, in your that, article that this yeah. would have been a, a good opportunity for filmmakers to draw attention to a story that actually isn't very widely known. People don't know much about this. But if they're going to do that and, and misrepresent the history, that's a problem, isn't it? Well, it is a problem. Obviously, the film is uh, driven by the impulse to create uh, black uh, sort of uh, people who are in some shape or form heroic and white people who are their polar opposite. There's a kind of moral contrast that's drawn all the way through the film, to the point at which you get this reverse kind of racism. You know, in the old days, you used to have uh, films being made by white directors that portrayed black people as inferior, morally inferior, and white people as being very positive and, and, and real role models. This is the reverse of that. And I think what's really tragic about the film is that it distorts history, but also creates this impression that slave, uh, slavery that's carried out in Africa by Africans is okay. The only problem with slavery is when white Brits and Portuguese are in, in the business of carrying it out. Can I ask you, Frank, about this notion of artistic representation? Because, of course, when it comes to artists, artists are free, are they not, to change history if they want, uh, to, to re-represent it, even misrepresent it. We recently had uh, a, a play in London about Joan of Arc, which depicted her as non-binary with they, them pronouns, which she wouldn't have yeah. understood, <laughs> for one thing, because she speaks French. But um, <laughs> what do you make of that, that surely these filmmakers are entitled to change the history if they want to? Uh, as it happens, I, I agree with that. I think throughout the last 300 years, yeah, literary license has always been recognised as an integral to the aesthetic artistic experience. So I've got no problems with that. And very often historic films uh, distort reality and, and kind of uh, read history backwards in accordance with the outlook and the inclination of the film director and the producer. So that is normal. But what is very interesting for me, especially as a sociologist, is that we're now getting a, a kind of a genre of films and plays particularly in, in the United States, which continually send out the same message. Which the message is, is that Western history, Western culture is contam contaminated, it's toxic, it's got no redeeming features. It's really a culture of slaving other people, whereas the rest of society, the rest of the world, are angels, basically people who are deserving of our respect and our moral support. And that kind of uh, sort of polarized view of the past is really nothing more than the an expression of what's going on today. It's really identity politics looking for a way of plundering history to legitimate itself. And for that reason, although I found the film in parts quite interesting and you know, quite exciting, it does remind me of the kind of films that were made in Stalinist Russia, where the nice peasants smiling around a tractor 
where the heroes and the horrible bourgeois people who were trying to make money were kind of cast into the role of being devils as a kind of horrible conformist aesthetic kind of uh, regime that's being imposed upon history. I think that's the problem, isn't it, with these kind of uh, politicised revisions, is that it start, all starts to feel like state-sanctioned art, particularly when it's going for an establishment narrative, isn't it? And we're seeing this again and again, aren't we? Not just on film, but in television, books, the publishing industry is full of it. It is, and, and it gets to the point where whenever I watch a new Netflix production, I can almost tell in advance that the white heterosexual man is going to be cast into the role of being a potential abuser of children and women. The most sensitive people will be the, uh, I suppose, the transgender children who are always more expressive and more able to understand and you know the world and read the room. And you got this kind of caricatures, I mean, real stereotypical caricatures that doesn't require very much artistic fantasy. And what we end up with is a, a, is a cultural regime, particularly produced by California, which continually pumps out the idea that promoting a certain view of identity is the way forward. And anybody who opposes that is on the wrong side of history. Do you think it's a little bit patronising the way that filmmakers are behaving insofar as they don't seem to believe that their audiences understand that history is quite nuanced, difficult, that you can't be reduced to a kind of Disneyfied good versus evil? Most people get that, right? And, and, and it's, it makes for a more interesting film if you actually explore it in that way. You're right. I, I think what's very interesting is that they assume that the uh, audience consists of, of a bunch of uh, infantilized children who are biologically mature, but in their heads are like six and seven year olds who need to be continually affirmed and validated. They can't imagine that black people watching a film are interested in uh, aesthetic exploration, you know, that black people are capable just as much as white people of dealing with the uh, subtleties and the, the nuances and the tensions that exist within a drama. So they have got to be given a, a completely simplistic account what has happened in the past. They think in this way, they're affirming the victims of history rather than understanding that what they're doing is instead of uh, uh, fixing the problems of the past, they're fixing the problems of the present. Instead of learning from history, they're teaching history a lesson. I mean, that's really what these films are doing. But they're telling history, you were bad, white people were bad, Brit British people were bad, and we're gonna make you pay for that. Frank Ferretti, thanks very much for your time. Now, this is the part of the show where we're going to talk through your unfiltered dilemmas, and we're going to announce the three winners who will receive Battle of Ideas festival tickets for their winning entries. So our first winner, Arnold Tabor. And Arnold Tabor emailed in. His dilemma is, I have lots of ideas. I just don't have the social setting or connections since my mental health has improved. How do I get the opportunity to thrive as a smart and skilled autistic white working class man in the UK? Francis, any thoughts about that? I mean, that is a hell of a question. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Uh, my first thing to think that someone who actually spent a lot of their teaching career teaching autistic people is uh, go into IT, because most of you look <laughs> smash it on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think the problem is, Arnold, is that we have been conditioned and in order to think of ourselves in these categories, white, working class, autistic. I would encourage you not to think like that. I would encourage you, Arnold, to think, what is it that I want from my life? What is it that I desire? What is it that I'm good at? And what is it that I want to do? And once you start to think of the world in that way and you start to write down your goals, I promise you, Arnold, that you will start to see pathways within your life in order for, that you will be able to achieve this goal. Don't think of yourself in these ways because they're just reductive ways for you to look at yourself and that demeans you and reduces you to a set of characteristics and believe me you are far more than that yeah. wow that's a great answer i think i'm so used to sort of uh, flippant answers in this segment and that's actually a helpful one that yeah helpful yeah, yeah 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 in fact i i if i wasn't autistic i would uh, wait, maybe I am. If, if, <laughs> no, I was thinking if I wasn't, I'd want to be from that answer because it makes me think there's a lot to overcome hmm. when yeah, you're in that yeah. situation. And that makes a stronger, better person. He might be a good stand-up comic because so many comics hmm. true. are, you know, ad admittedly autistic. And part of the reason, I think, is because they can 
not that I know anything about autism really, but they seem to be able to focus and hone in on a particular yeah. point very ex exclusively, very... You but know. he might not be very funny. Yeah, like that. but that's okay. Most, most comedies, most comedies yeah. aren't, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect job for you. Um, second winner tonight is Will Petit, and his dilemma is... What is the best way to broach discussions with people I know are ideologically opposed to me while remaining respectful and understanding towards them? I mean, that's, Will, that's pretty much what this whole show is about. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly trying to invite people who think I'm the devil incarnate yeah. to come onto the show to chat to me because they'll realise I'm not. I'm just one of his minions. You know? Buy them a drink. <laughs> Buy them a drink. Buy them yeah. a drink. It really, especially in this country, it really, it really gets them on your side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, and maybe put a pill in it so they quiet down. Yeah. <laughs> but just, you know, just remembering that people are human beings. Like, you know, this is like the woman saying she wouldn't resuscitate people if they voted Tory. It's like, just remember that everyone, people who see the world differently than you, they're just another human being. They're just, you know, yeah, yeah. it's not people necessarily evil. People say that about Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't say that about Hitler. That's the key. He but was a dog person, though. Yeah. He was. But I think and know, a vegetarian. He was, yeah. I, and so he claimed. And I, I, I think, um, <laughs> I think also if you can joke your way through a conversation, yeah, yeah. it really helps. Humor yeah. really changes people's minds. I think so. And also as well, this is the most important thing. Just realize it's a conversation. Yeah. Somebody's yeah, yeah, yeah. going to come with their opinion. You're going to come with yours. And if you go with the spirit of like. Maybe I'm going to learn something. Yep. Or at the very least, I'm going to get to understand well, the way that you see the world. How about, kind of a how about not assuming that you've got all the answers? How about assuming yeah. that the person you're talking to could be right about something and you could be wrong? I mean, that's, where, yeah. that's my always standing point. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna, we've got to crack on. Our final winner is Ed Vickers. And Ed Vickers' dilemma is, I'm in bed under my duvet wrapped up in a jumper and I'm freezing. <laughs> my housemates have said that it's way too hot to put the heating on. But they don't pay the energy bill, so that doesn't apply to them. Mm -hmm. They've said that I'm not right if I'm cold. What should I do? Is it me or is it really cold? <laughs> well, uh, Ed, trust yourself. I think. What do you think, Francis? If it? you identify as cold, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. He sounds. He sounds lonely, actually. To <laughs> yeah. me. Like he wants a partner in bed with him. That's what it sounds like. I think he's. I kind of think he's hitting on you. I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> Maybe. Well, we'll find out because he's coming to the Battle of Ideas next weekend. Now, yeah. and by the way, you should. So those are our three winners, and uh, they'll, they'll be getting their tickets uh, very, very soon. But I would urge people again to go along to the Battle of Ideas this weekend. I'm going to be filming this show on the Saturday night, mm -hmm. and then it will go out on the Sunday. We have some amazing uh, guests for that show. It's always a lot of fun, and you can, like Claire said earlier. You can go and see all these debates all weekend. Uh, and it's, it's honestly one of the highlights of my year. Anyway, and also, I must finally, before we go, plug Francis Foster's tour. What's the tour called, Francis? Uh, it's called Online Provocateur. Yes. Uh, because that is Accurate. What, yes, indeed it is. <laughs> uh, it's because it's a former friend called me when uh, w what he'd said I had now become after I started to speak honestly about yeah. things that I felt were important in society. And you're going everywhere in the country, right? I'm you're going everywhere in the country. Basically, if a town is not doing very well and has suffered from deindustrialization, I will be there on a <laughs> Fantastic. Wednesday night. <laughs> and how, how can people find tickets? Uh, FrancisFoster.co.uk. Um, so, yeah, it's, it will be proper comedy. It's a, an hour's comedy right the way through. I'm not going to tell you 40 minutes in how I met a cat in India to make you cry. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we have that moment. It's just going to be jokes. It's just going to be jokes. Sounds great to me. Come along to that, and thank you for joining us for Free Speech Nation. This was the week when mermaids started to flounder, the protests in Iran gained momentum, and Elon Musk said he would buy Twitter after all. Hooray! Mm. Thank you to my panel, Francis Foster and Scott Caporo, and of course, to my lovely guests, Monita, Elna Sabah, Claire Fox, Dennis Kavanagh, and Frank Ferredi. And by the way, if you want to join us live in the studio, be part of our wonderful audience, you can do that. Go to www.sroaudiences.com. That's not going to be for next week, but for the weekend after and the week after that and ad infinitum and if you want to come to the battle of ideas next week check out their website come along and say hello uh, stay tuned for the brilliant mark dolan tonight that's next do not forget that headliners is on every night at 11 o'clock that's the late night paper preview show where comedians like us talk you through the next day's top news stories thanks for watching free speech nation goodbye looking ahead to tomorrow's weather Rain continues to push across southeastern parts first thing on Monday, drier elsewhere. Let's take a look at the details. Across Scotland, we can expect plenty of showers feeding in on the cold northwesterly wind. More southern and eastern parts should start the day mostly dry but quite chilly. Similar for Northern Ireland, a bright but chilly start to the day for many, with just a few showers, most likely towards the northwest.
Overnight rain will have long cleared northwestern England. Again, a few showers are possible, especially towards the coast. Further inland, it will be largely dry. In Wales, overnight temperatures will drop into the low single figures, meaning it'll be chilly but sunny first thing on Monday. Some coastal showers possible. Rain will be clearing the East Midlands early in the morning. Some heavy bursts are possible, but it will quickly turn drier with clearer skies spreading from the northwest and easing winds. A wet start for East Anglia, where there will be cloud, rain and strong winds at first. However, this will all clear through the morning with drier and brighter weather on the way. This is how it's looking across much of southern England. Rain is going to have arrived overnight, but will clear away to the southeast through the morning. As the rain clears away to the southeast, it'll be cooler but sunnier for most, with showers in the northwest. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, if the Tories continue their infighting and undermining new Prime Minister Liz Truss, they'll be out of power for a generation. As the SNP start their annual conference, is an independent Scotland now inevitable? We'll speak to a top figure from the SNP and showbiz legends, the Crankies. Plus tomorrow's papers with full panel reaction, politics legend Anne Widdicombe and our quiz of the week. A busy Sunday night show. See you at nine. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, if the Tories continue their infighting and undermining our new Prime Minister Liz Truss, they will be out of power for a generation. As the SNP start their annual conference, is an independent Scotland now inevitable? We'll speak to a top figure from the SNP and one half of Scottish showbiz legends, the Crankies. Plus, tomorrow's papers with full panel reaction. Very excited about my panel tonight. They're waiting in the wings. They are coming in hot. We've also got politics legend Anne Widdicombe and Labour Brexiteer Brendan Chilton on whether Liz Truss can make it to Christmas. Plus, we've got our quiz of the week at 10.45, a brand new fixture on the show. And I want you to take part more on that later. A busy Sunday night show. We don't do boring, not on my watch. First, the headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Mark, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. 
Vigils have been held across County Donegal in Ireland today in memory of the 10 people killed in a petrol station explosion. Eight other people were injured in the blast in the village of Creesler last Friday. Police, who've now named all 10 victims, say a man in his 20s remains in a critical condition. Earlier today, Pope Francis offered his condolences to the, to the people of Ireland. Irish authorities say the incident is being treated as a tragic accident, though investigations are ongoing. The president of the SNP says the Supreme Court will fail the people of Scotland if it doesn't allow the government to hold a second independence referendum. The Supreme Court will hear arguments this week before ruling if a prospective bill to hold another vote is within the powers of Holyrood. The Scottish government has emphasised its intention to hold an independence referendum in October next year regardless of the ruling. Scotland's Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, says his party's task is to engage with the people they couldn't win over in the 2014 referendum. We cannot be at the mercy of Westminster decisions any longer. Scotland has to choose to be an independent country. It is a task that can chart a new course for Scotland. It is a task that we must and we will win. Police have named a man shot dead by officers in a police station car park in Derby on Friday. 35-year-old Marius Sherlock of Osmaston Road was armed with a knife. He was taken to hospital where he was pronounced dead. The Independent Office for Police Conduct is investigating the incident. At least 13 people have been killed after shelling in the Ukrainian city Saporizhia. Around 87 others, including 10 children, were injured. According to the local governor, there were at least 12 Russian missile strikes on the area, partially destroying an apartment block and damaging other residential buildings. Authorities say a rescue operation is underway to search for people trapped under rubble. In Iran, 185 people, including 19 children, are said to have died in protest across the country over the last three weeks. Demonstrations began last month following the death of Masa Amini, who was detained by the morality police over allegations she was wearing her hijab too loosely. According to the Iran Human Rights Group, hundreds of women and girls have taken part in protests despite accusations of authorities using brutal treatment to disperse them. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, let's get straight back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. My Mark Meets guest is one of the most respected and experienced high-profile journalists in the country, Michael Crick the maverick political reporter from Newsnight and Channel 4 News. He's also the biographer of Jeffrey Archer, Sir Alex Ferguson, and our very own Nigel Farage. That's Michael Crick spilling the beans on some of the most significant people in the world of politics and sport, live in the studio from 10. What does he really think of our Nigel? As the SNP start their annual conference, is an independent Scotland now inevitable? We'll speak to a tall, uh, former top figure from the SNP and one half of Scottish showbiz legends, The Cranky. We're going to speak to Ian Tuff later in the show. And with me throughout the programme is my fantastic all-star panel, journalist and broadcaster Lizzie Zeta. Political commentator, columnist and founder of the Contrarian Prize. We like a contrarian here on Mark Dolan tonight. Goes against the grain, Ali Mirage. And last but not least, you've got a sneak preview there. A brand new star on Mark Dolan tonight, making her debut. What a thrill to welcome journalist and political consultant, Emma Burnell. Now, I want to hear from you throughout the show, mark at gbnews.uk. The best bit of my show is when you get in touch. Your emails are the best. And this program has a golden rule. Do you know what that rule is? We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. I won't have it! So, for the next two hours, big debates, big guests, and always big opinions. Let's start with this one. I'm not sure the Tories deserve power anymore. 
Do they even want it? After 12 years in office, is this political juggernaut the most successful party in the history of European democracy running out of steam? If the Tories do implode at the next election, it won't be down to Keir Starmer, the cervix-free leader of the opposition, who's one of the most mediocre Labour leaders in its history. No one gets excited about this man, even on his own side, because he lacks the ideological purity and zeal of Jeremy Corbyn, and he lacks the polished middle ground presentation of Tony Blair, whose political instincts were pitch perfect, hence three election landslide victories. But voters may reluctantly conclude in January 2025, the date of our next expected poll, that the bang average Keir Starmer, Mr. Vanilla, a man who's neither fish nor fowl, a man who can't even define a woman even though he's married to one, is at least in charge of a party that wants to govern. Starmer's great achievement since getting into uh, the leadership role and winning that top job has been in excavating toxic figures like Jeremy Corbyn from his party and going some way to ridding Labour of the ghost of anti-Semitism. And as Labour Party conference demonstrated just two weeks ago, he seems to have united the party and the wider Labour grassroots around his vision, which is more interventionist, more high tax and big state than new Labour, but more fiscally conservative than Jeremy Corbyn. He's pitched his